So hi and welcome to another episode of Biographics. I am your interim host, Carl Smallwood. I am drinking out of a Hello Kitty mug and today we're talking about George Reeves and the mysterious death of Superman. In the early hours of June 16th, 1959, a shot rang out in Los Angeles' swanky Benedict Canyon. And just like that, something that was thought impossible had happened. Superman was dead. In case it wasn't the real Superman, but the actor who'd played him for over 100 episodes in the adventures of Superman television show, George Reeves. The police quickly ruled it a clear suicide, and no thorough investigation was ever conducted into the death of Mr. Reeves. Many questions still lingered though. Multiple people wanted Reeves dead, and there were some strange elements regarding his demise. So did the actor really kill himself, or did someone manage to do the impossible and kill Superman? George Reeves was born George Kiefer Brewer on January 5th, 1914, in the small town of Woolstock, Iowa. He was the only child of Don Brewer and Helen Lesher, a young couple who only got hitched because Helen became pregnant with George. A popular origin story for many people, including Superman, apparently. Surprisingly, this didn't last, and the two called it quits just a few months after their baby was born. Helen took George, packed up her bags, and moved to Pasadena, California. There, she met a man named Frank Bacello, one of the few people who got rich by making alcohol during Prohibition. Legally, that is, because his family produced wine for the Catholic Church. Anyway, Frank and Helen got married, and Frank formally adopted George in 1927. The two were close. Too close, in fact, for Helen's liking. He was quite possessive of her son and didn't like competing for his affection. After 15 years, Helen and Frank divorced, and following a generous settlement, Helen could afford to buy her own home in a nice neighbourhood in Pasadena, where it would just be her and George with nobody else to cramp their style. I'm getting major psycho vibes from this. The film for anyone who's not seen it. As George grew up, he developed into quite a looker. He had a strong 6 foot 2, 190 pound frame, plus chiselled good looks. Not shared by your host here. Uh, it's no wonder that his mother imagined him as the next Hollywood heartthrob, but then George did something she greatly disapproved of. He took up boxing in high school. Maybe this was his way of rebelling against a very domineering mother. He was good at it too, enough to qualify for the Golden Gloves tournament, but Helen was worried that he would damage his good looks, so she forbade him to take part. Eventually, George caved to his mother's wishes and he gave up on the sweet science, and in 1935, the 21-year-old enrolled to study acting at Pasadena Community Playhouse. Over the next few years, George stuck to the stage, appearing in multiple plays, but at the same time grew frustrated as he saw many of his acting partners successfully landing roles on the silver screen. This was a frustration he would become very familiar with over the course of his life. But the time would come for George in 1939, when he finally made his big screen debut, and it was a pretty big one. The scuttlebutt around town was that Hollywood bigwig David O. Selznick was looking to make a screen adaptation of the 1939 hit novel, Gone with the Wind. George thought that he was perfect to play a young southern gentleman, he had the looks and could pull off the accent. Apparently the movie's casting director Max Arno agreed, so he signed him on for the role of Stuart Talton, one of Scarlett O'Hara's suitors. Everything seemed to be going George's way, but there was one tiny problem, the name. George went by the name George Bacello after his adopted father, but the studio execs felt this was a bit too foreign for 1930s America, especially for an actor who was supposed to embody a southern gentleman. So he decided to change it, and thus George Reeves was born. <laughs> Reeves didn't exactly have the biggest role in the movie, but we're talking about Gone with the Wind. Like Every actor in it affected some degree of attention, and George's turn as Stuart Tallerton was enough to get him a contract with Warner Bros. This wasn't a particularly fruitful relationship though, Reeves appeared in a string of pretty forgettable movies, and usually playing second or third banana to a more established star like James Cagney or Merle Oberon. Eventually, Warner's decided that maybe Reeves wasn't their next big star and dissolved his contract in 1941. From there, he moved to 20th Century Fox on a short one-year contract, but it's pretty much a repeat of the same experience. Reeves mostly had minor roles in a handful of movies before the studio said, thanks for coming, and chose not to renew his contract. Although his career wasn't exactly skyrocketing right now, there was one significant moment in his life. In 1940, Reeves met and married a young actress named Eleonora Needles. The pair stayed together for almost a decade and had no children together. That's a great name for her, Eleonora Needles. <laughs> Mrs. Needles. Mrs. George Needles. Now, without a contract, Reeves thought it'd be a good idea to do a bit of freelancing. As someone who used to freelance, 
Don't recommend. Yes, it's horrible. He wanted to focus on Western since those were a hot ticket item. Reeves appeared in five films featuring a popular cowboy character named Hopalong Cassidy as his sidekick before finally catching the eyes of Paramount Pictures. The first studio actually saw some star potential in him. They offered him a serious role in a war drama called So Proudly We Hail, and Reeves gladly traded his chaps and spurs for a military uniform. He played the male lead opposite Claudette Colbert and impressed Paramount bosses enough to sign a contract with them, but just when it looked like Reeves' career was firmly on the upswing, it took a a massive nosedive thanks to, as you probably guessed from the dates I've said, World War II, as he received his recruitment papers. Reeves got drafted into the army, and although he never saw any actual combat, in fact he was mostly stationed in New York City as part of the Army Air Force Special Forces Division, acting in a Broadway play named Winged Victory that was meant to boost morale and raise money for the Army Emergency Relief Fund, he eventually got transferred to the Motion Picture Unit where he made training recruitment films, as well as one on venereal diseases titled Sex Hygiene. And, and we've all got to start somewhere, and my mind turns to Jonathan Banks, um, uh, you know, Mike from Breaking Bad, who cut his teeth appearing in a PSA where he thought that a woman being on a period would make her bowl better. That's 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 not hyperbole. <laughs> Admittedly, though, he had a pretty good sense of humour about it, and he appeared like a John Oliver bit where he uh, reprised his role and made fun of his... Uh, his past self. Anyway, once the war was over, Reeves discovered just how fickle Hollywood could be when your name is not up in lights at the marquee. The public tends to forget you pretty fast. There was a glimmer of hope for him it came in one of Tinseltown's next leading stars, following So Proudly We Hail. It had more or less been extinguished. When Reeves got back home, he was shocked to discover that his biggest supporter at Paramount, the director-producer for So Proudly We Hail, Mark Sandrich, had died suddenly. Sandrich was the man who promised that he was going to turn George Reeves into a big star, and it seemed that everyone else at the studio was a bit more lukewarm about his potential as a leading man. And it was not like George actually fought in the war like fellow actors such as Jimmy Stewart or Clark Gable. All he did was a stage play in New York and talk about like venereal diseases, so he couldn't exactly play the returning hero card to help him get any roles. With Hollywood not exactly busting down his door, Reeves travelled to New York where he appeared in a bunch of radio dramas. It wasn't until 1947 that he got to appear in a film again. That was only a cameo in Variety Girl. In 1948, it was a bit more fruitful for Reeves with several more movie roles, but these were all poorly paid. Small roles in B-movies had no chance of resurrecting his dwindling career. And things were about to get even worse in 1949 when George's professional life reaches an idea when he starred in a 15-chapter serial set in Arthurian times titled The Adventures of Sir Galahad. The sets were cheap and reused from old westerns, even though the action was supposed to take place in medieval England. The writing was terrible, the acting was worse, and even for a matinee show, this was seen as scraping the bottom of the barrel for any actor. Uh, but life wasn't done kicking Reeves in the balls just yet, because his personal life wasn't going so hot either, and his wife divorced him in 1949, fed up with the insecure life of a struggling actor, and instead preferred getting hitched to a rich attorney. But then, George received the shock of his life one day when he was approached by a middle-aged man who introduced himself as Don Brewer, aka his biological father father. The reason this was such a surprise for Reeves was that his mother had always told him that his father had committed suicide, and this new revelation caused a rift between the two that would take years to heal. Things, to put it diplomatically, were not looking great for George Reeves at the time, but then fate threw him a life preserver. A life preserver wearing red and blue spandex. All throughout the 1940s, there was a radio series titled The Adventures of Superman, which ran for over 2,000 episodes. It wasn't exactly surprising that in 1951, Hollywood execs thought it might work in this new and crazy medium called television. There had also been a film serial in 1948 starring Kirk Allen as Superman, so alas, despite what some might claim, George Reeves was not the first live-action Superman, though he was the first person to don the mantle for TV. Speaking of Reeves, there is a popular myth that states that he got the job after the show's producers spotted him on Muscle Beach in Venice, California, which isn't true. Although it is true that producers scoped out bodybuilders for the role of Superman. Eventually, they decided that good looks and acting ability, though, were more important. Fake rubber muscles were good enough. They had actually considered over 200 actors for the role, but producer writer Robert Maxwell knew he had found the Man of Steel the moment Reeves walked through the door. Apparently, it was the jaw that did it for them. As a little bonus fact about how Reeves got the role, like he was, as mentioned earlier in the video, like very like, you know, well built and toned, and to establish that he could pull off the look of Superman, you know, the spandex and underwear over them, uh, he had to strip down to his underwear for producers and then proceeded to carry one of them up a flight of stairs like a fireman, to show that he had, like, you know, the, the physical strength um, to portray the Man of Steel. So now Reeves had the role, but he wasn't sure that he really wanted it. Television had only really started to take off in American houses after World War II. By many actors, George included, it was still seen as the place where careers went to die. But just like Galahad, he assumed this would be some crappy low-budget kid stuff that nobody would actually see, so he swallowed his pride, and as many actors have done in the past, and since, did it for the money. 
And the series actually started off with a one hour feature titled Superman and the Mole Man, which acts as a pilot for the show itself. After that, production immediately started on the rest of the series, but got shot down soon after due to lack of interest. Pretty much what Reeves expected to happen, but then someone came to the rescue. And it wasn't a bird or a plane, but Kellogg's The Serial Company. As it turns out, they had sponsored the Adventures of Superman Radio Serial and wanted to do the same for the television show. And I, I, am I the only one who finds it amusing that the people who made Serial sponsored a radio serial? I know it's Serial with a C and Serial with an S, but... That's, that's some good pun work right there. It wasn't until February 1953, however, that the events of Superman actually premiered on American TV, and to the shock of almost everybody involved, George included, it became a success almost immediately. Overnight, George Reeves became Superman to many Americans, much to his own displeasure. He still hoped that the TV show would be nothing but a quick paycheck and maybe a springboard in some better movie roles for him, because the movies were still where his heart lay, but the truth is that in 1953, the same year Superman came out, he got cast in major motion pictures. The war drama From Here to Eternity, it was his biggest movie role since So Proud Louis Hale, and Reeves hoped that maybe a career resurrection was on the horizon. But then his heart was crushed during a sneak preview. As Reeves appeared on screen, everyone in the audience started shouting, Superman, Superman, there's Superman, and they filled out their preview cards and wrote how cool it was to see Superman in the movie. The film's producers were not happy about the character of Superman taking away the spotlight, especially since Reeves was a minor role in the movie, so in the end, they cut it completely. Reeves only had a single film role after this. After that, he relied himself to the fact that for better or worse, he was Superman. The Superman TV show went on for six seasons and well over a hundred episodes. On top of that, Reeves was paid for all sorts of appearances as the Man of Steel, so he was earning a pretty decent paycheck, but still nothing compared to the big stars of Hollywood. He still felt like he was wasting his life, but at the same time realised that nothing better would probably come along, especially since he was already in his mid-40s by the time the series had ended. Reeves' private life was decidedly murkier than his squeaky clean public image he projected as Superman. Ever since 1951, Reeves had maintained a secret relationship with an older, and more importantly, married woman named Tony Mannix, a former showgirl. And by secret, we mean that everyone in Hollywood knew about it since the couple was not exactly shy about parading around together at all kinds of social events, but the relationship was never mentioned in public out of respect and fear for Tony's husband, Eddie Mannix. Ostensibly, Eddie Mannix was a film exec at MGM Studios, but in reality, he was known as a fixer, a thug who uses connections and gangster tactics to keep stars in line and the indiscretions out of the newspapers. At best, the man helped silence cases of public drunkenness that got out of hand, drug busts, affairs, the occasional DUI, and maybe arranged for a few secret abortions. At worst, he had been accused of covering up rapes, violent assaults, and perhaps even murder. In other words, Mannix was known to be a man not to be messed with, but Reeves was allegedly in the clear with him. It seems that Eddie Mannix knew of his wife's relationship with the actor and was fine with it as long as he too was allowed to have his own affairs. And Tony Mannix was by no means an informidable woman. She knew how to get what she wanted. Thanks in part to her husband, she had all sorts of power and the money to get what she wanted. So when what she wanted was a boy toy to parade around town with, she knew exactly what she had to do to keep him. She bought Reeves a fancy house, she also bought him cars and paid for most of his bills. They were all in Tony's name, so of course, she basically owned him. The strategy worked for around eight years, but eventually Reeves fell in love with another woman and wanted to marry again, something which he couldn't do with Tony Maddox. Her name was Lenore Lemon, a socialite from New York who was ostensibly just as possessive, jealous and domineering as Tony Mannix and George's mother. It seemed that Reeves only ever knew one type of woman. In 1958, Reeves broke up with Tony Mannix and started seeing Lenore Lemon. As you might expect, the latter did not take it well, but didn't kick Reeves out of his home, which technically belonged to her. Instead, she began harassing the new couple, probably thinking that she could still manipulate or coerce George into coming back. Instead, he took out a restraining order against her. On June 19th, 1959, George and Leonora were supposed to get married in Mexico and then leave on their honeymoon to Europe. This never happened. Three days earlier, the couple were having drinks with a few people over at their house. In the wee hours of the morning, Reeves went upstairs and retired to the bedroom. Allegedly, that's when Lenore told the rest of the group that George was possibly going there to shoot himself. Everyone either thought this was a joke or was too drunk to care because nobody moved, and then a shot rang out. After they heard the shot, Lenore asked one of the guests, neighbour William Bliss, to go upstairs and check on Reeves. Bliss did as requested, and upon entering the bedroom, he saw the body of the actor lying naked in a pool of blood with a 30 calibre Luger between his feet. He then went downstairs and informed the rest of the party that Reeves had died. After the police were called, two LAPD officers arrived and inspected the scene. They found that Reeves had been shot in the temple in an upward trajectory, with the bullet getting lodged in the ceiling. The spent casing was beneath his corpse. For the non-CSI aficionados out there, this meant that it got ejected and landed on the bed before the body, which was unusual, but not conclusive by itself. 
The cops did their due diligence and interviewed everybody downstairs. They were all drunk, but gave more or less the same story. Lenore said that Reeves had been depressed over his dwindling career and his new money troubles, and now that he didn't have Tony Mannix as his sugar mama anymore. For the police, this made perfect sense, an open and shut case of suicide if there ever was one. You know how sensitive and emotional these actor types can be? To the point they didn't even call in the crime squad to take photographs or dust for fingerprints. They just called the coroner and went on their way. Um, at the medical examiner's lab, the coroner gave the body a once-over to make sure there were no other signs of violence. He didn't find any for anyone curious, and since the police ruled it an unsuspicious death, he had no reason to perform an internal examination. He too thought it was a straightforward case of suicide, so he washed the body and embalmed it. Later, it was sometimes reported that Reeves did have bruises on his chest and face, but this has never been thoroughly corroborated by other sources. The first person to suspect that not everything was on the level was George's mother, Helen. As soon as she arrived in Los Angeles, she hired a private detective agency to conduct their own investigation. Like many of George's close friends, she refused to believe that he could commit suicide, and although the private eyes did find weird things about Reeves' death, it was never enough to get the case reopened. So therefore, we are left with nothing but speculation regarding any alternative outcomes to the death of Superman. But since we've got time, let's just delve into the conspiracies, shall we? So one plausible scenario implicates his wife-to-be, Lenore Lemon. On the night in question, she waited about 45 minutes after George's death to call the police. This could have had sinister motive, but a more plausible explanation is that the people in the house wanted to sober up since they were all pretty wasted. After all, why would three other people who weren't close to Lenore help her get away with murder? Why exactly she'd want George dead? We can't say, but she did sneak into the house the following day, breaking the police seal on the door. She was caught red-handed by the executor of Reeves' estate, Art Weissman, who was among those convinced that his friend did not kill himself. It seems that Lenore went there to steal $4,000 in traveller's checks. After that, she hired an expensive lawyer, went back to New York, and stayed there, washing her hands of the whole affair. But what about the more obvious and sexier possibility that Reeves was done in by Tony and Eddie Mannix? Of all the people involved in the story, Eddie Mannix would have been the most likely to arrange a hit on an actor since he had alleged ties to the mob. But would he do that to avenge the hurt pride of his wife? It certainly would have been a unique case where a man killed his wife's new lover, but not because she slept with her, but because he stopped sleeping with her. And the one suggested piece of evidence in this direction comes courtesy of Phyllis Coates, the actress who played Lois Lane in the Superman TV show. Decades after the fact, she said that she'd received a phone call from Tony Mannix at around 4.30 in the morning on the day of Reeves' death. Tony was hysterical and hyperventilating, ranting about how George had been murdered. But this was way before the news had been made public, so how could she have known? Later still, a tabloid story showed that Tony Mannix confessed on her deathbed to having Reeves killed. And as conclusive as that might all sound, it has been dismissed as pure hearsay. After all, we already knew that Tony Mannix had a motive, but it doesn't explain how the killer got in, did the deed, and then got out without being seen, or why they undressed Reeves for that matter. As a result, the question of Reeves' death has no concrete answer, and will probably continue to puzzle, fascinate, and frustrate crime buffs for years to come. Until then, we can only accept the official series of events which states the actor was depressed and killed himself, thus bringing a inglorious and ignominious end to the end of television's original, Superman. So cheers to everyone at home for tuning into this episode of Biographics. I've been your interim host, Carl Smallwood. Uh, thank you to Top Tens for allowing me to step in. If you recognise my face from anywhere, and it's not from the other videos that we've been making for um, uh, Biographics, the sister channels, Geographics and Top Tens, it's likely from Fact Fiend, which you can find linked below, which is the channel I started many years ago. And yeah, if you like this video, like, let us know in the comments, leave a like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And as always, have the day you all deserve. Cheers.